There is little amusement to be derived from the living when you have been dead for almost 500 years. Once I would have chuckled at the way people visiting St. Helen's Church puzzled over this slab. Now it has become mundane. Two wives, they say querulously, and both named Elizabeth. I wonder how that came about. Then they move on. They do not show me my due respect. They lack the intellect to ask deeper questions. They no longer speak Latin and do not understand the inscription at my feet. They are, for the most part, like those gathered here now, uneducated commoners. Oh, do not take offence. Let us test the theory. Who amongst you speaks Latin? I thought not. The more enlightened ask whether each wife would approve of the other, each lying on her pillow, one either side of me. As well they might. In life I was your first wife, Elizabeth Nundy, and should have been the only one. Indeed, to my dying day I believe that to be the case. Now I find myself here, a body's width from my usurper, and she on your right hand, Robert Nundy, and with the better pillow and most splendid girdle. My dearest wife. At your command, my dearest Robert. I believe you will find that our husband addresses me. I am certain, dear lady, that he does not, for the term that he used was my dearest wife, was it not? That can only apply to me. My lady, you are presumptuous. In life you are an upstart, death has not improved you. My dearest ladies both, must this bickering continue for another 500 years? We are stuck here together in purgatory and will ever remain so unless we can reach a state of grace where our sins are forgiven. Robert Nundy, where was my sin? Was I not a faithful and humble wife and mother? Did I not meet my end in childbirth, bringing forth a son to carry on your name? Was I not pious? I prayed four times each day. And yet even in my confinement, that snake in the grass, that usurper, that upstart was at your side, whispering in your ear, stirring up a witchcraft to beguile you and take you from me, even had I lived. Madam, desist. I refute that as I have throughout this half millennium and will continue for the next. Must I lie here for eternity, besmirched by your bitter tongue, denied heaven by your false allegations? Madam, it is your actions that have led us to this. Were we not once the very best of friends? I treated you as my sister, I brought you into my household to elevate your station, confided in you and prayed by your side. Then, even as my belly swelled with Robert's child, he was looking over my shoulder into your bewitching eyes. This is truly my purgatory. For 500 years I have been unable to look either left or right without accusations of favour from one or the other wife. It is good that death has given neither one a good sense to see into my heart, for I rue the day I married either, now that I am forced to lie together with both. Yet it was my intention that these good women, both of whom served me well in life and, and whom I thought loved each other as much as each loved me, would be companionable in the hereafter, if only we could reach it. I believe that I had accounted for that too, and atoned for our collective sins by leaving property in this town of Ashby de la Zouche to the church, so that an obit, an annual requiem, may be said in perpetuity for the sake of all three of our souls. I do not understand what has happened, for I no longer hear a requiem, or indeed the Latin tongue spoken, even here in God's house. I despair of ever escaping purgatory without the prayers of many to lift us to heaven. It seems that it was my sin, and I have often wholeheartedly confessed my sin, such a small thing really when you hear the stories of others from their graves, 
was to look too fondly on my second lady, even as Elizabeth was my lawful wife. I suspect many here are guilty of such sins. Be warned then, husbands, and avert your eyes when a comely woman enters your home. You too may face an eternity of purgatory for such a small and insignificant seeming sin. You good people must be wondering too how we both came by the name of Elizabeth when one is so clearly more deserving of the epithet than the other. Here we go again. Not content with robbing me of my husband, she would also have my good name. There will be those among you who suppose that we were both named for the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. We see you there, working out the dates, pretending to know your history. Let us set you straight. Our good husband, Robert, died in the year of our Lord, 1526, while she, who was to become the good Queen Bess, was born in 1533, long after our deaths, which puts that theory to rest. It is scripture, not history, that you should be reading. Maybe then we should get our requiem. Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. You do me wrong once again. I am indeed named God's Oath, but from a canonised lady, Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, in whose name as a patron of beggars and charity, I naively and charitably took you in, only to be repaid with your treachery. Then, madam, you were ill-named. For Elizabeth is not the name of a shrew who would keep her husband and the object of her cold charity in purgatory for nigh on 500 years. And, my lady, and, I take contention with your suggestion that I was ever a beggar. My lineage is in my true name. Alice means noble. Would you but acknowledge it? Then why covet Elizabeth? Who are you really that taking my husband, my household and my worldly chattels in life was insufficient so that in death you must even take my name? I did not take your name, madam. I find it bestowed upon me by the hand of an ignorant and careless stonemason who must himself be in purgatory for this sin, if for no other. I am the one wronged by this deed, if not by the hand of the stonemason, then by the negligence of your son, who so poorly executed our husband's will. Have you no shame that you would lay blame on my poor motherless boy? Alice, Elizabeth, please, may I remind you both that we find ourselves within God's house and that your bickering is unseemly. Furthermore, need I remind you, Alice, that you are not alone in being erroneously inscribed. Were we all not Nundy before that rude copyist condemned us with an extra stroke of his chisel? Is it no wonder that our souls are lost when our names are as altered as our mortal remains? My largest sin, it seems, is my inability to keep the women of my house in order. Take pity on me, for when I was alive I did my best, and there are limits to what I am able to do now. Dearest Robert, we know that you were not at fault over the obit. Your bequest was ill-used. Who can insure against the state taking all that you so honestly earned in life? and so fastidiously bequeathed in death. Why, even now, in the 21st century, I have heard mutterings in funeral retinues about death duties, which, it seems, people still refer to as state robbery. My dear, thank you for your words of kindness. Nevertheless, it must be my fault for I am the head of this household, and I failed to secure us a place in heaven. Instead of lamenting your shortcomings, Robert Nundy, we should be counting our blessings. Perhaps then our prayers will be heard. You are right, of course, Elizabeth. There are God's mercies to be thankful for, and we should put our hands together to thank the Lord for the 1829 repewing of this church, which freed us from centuries beneath those trampling feet. And may I remind you both that others were less fortunate and still bear such indignities. Our position now, though tucked away and quite unfitting our station, 
does at least have an outlook. Indeed, poor wife Elizabeth suffered terribly whenever a member of the congregation wriggled in his seat. Imagine 300 years with the leg of a pew wearing away the most prominent feature of your face. Would that instead it had worn away your cruel tongue? Robert and I may have been spared the shuffling feet of centuries of sinners, yet we still suffered while we lay beneath the floor. It was difficult for me to retain my modesty at times. Oh, some of the sights I witnessed when the ladies sat above us were, were enough to keep us here for another 500 years. Robert Nundy. In 500 years, you have not learned to avert your eyes, even when all three of our souls are at stake. Until you do so, how can we ever hope to escape from this limbo? I need only escape from you, madam. Fool that I was. I thought the grave came between us. I cannot conceive the reasoning that led Robert to lie us all here together for eternity. Will there be no end to this torture? Without the obit in our true names, we are all three condemned to be here as long as our images remain. We came so close. With 31 years of obit to our credit, if only the state had not so brutally intervened and stolen your bequest, Robert, for another year, just one more requiem may have been sufficient to speed our souls to heaven. How truly you speak, Elizabeth. Yet I have not heard the De Profundis here for many, many decades. And who would intervene on our behalf now that my money has been squandered on a grammar school for the town? The right and proper use of that property was for prayer. Have you seen or heard many of the town's school children here of late? And when you do, what sorcery they bring with them? Tablets with moving images, loud and boisterous noises, that bewitch them as old potions never could. There, there you have it. Confession, if confession were needed of her witchcraft against me. You freely admit your use of potions, Alice. <laughs> would that I knew one strong enough to silence you. Ladies again, I beg you both, be kind to each other and have mercy on me. If you'd only let bygones be bygones, we might reach heaven yet. And I beg you to show forgiveness to the stonemason, as you would ask for forgiveness for yourselves. Now, at least, uh, though I agree it was neither my wish nor my intent, the children of Ashby, who have been educated at the grammar school, can spell. No other stonemason will inflict such grievous harm on the souls of the departed. Let us have hope that through our own sincere contrition, with help from a congregation such as this, gathered here this evening, we may yet step nearer to heaven. Are these gathered here really our last hope, Robert? Do you think they can even hear us? Or, or speak, speak the, the day profundus? profundus? Let, Let alone, alone sing, sing for, for us, us a requiem. requiem. In, In Latin. Latin. Ladies, one small miracle has already happened this evening, for I swear that you answered as one something that I have not heard for close on half a millennium. Let us then ask them with one voice and pray fervently that they not only hear, but that amongst them there is at least one who knows sufficient to offer up our obit. Ladies, listen. Ladies, is that not the most wonderful sound? Come. We must take our positions, we must put our hands together in prayer, we must put all our past woes behind us, and in forgiving each other, pray for our own forgiveness. Has it worked? Are we there yet? You look as you both looked on the day Alice entered our home, full of love for each other and hope for the future. And I am moved to be determined to look ahead, and only ahead, towards the light. Ladies, the path ahead is fraught, yet I believe that this glorious music has taken us one step closer to heaven.